Read out loud articles has no affiliation with this article. Article. The Flatterer and the Chatterer. Written by Marjorie Garber, July 22nd, 2020, and found in the Paris Review. The Theophrastan character is not often mentioned today, perhaps because it is so little known as a genre. Yet for centuries, this was what character meant in literature. A list of familiar social types compiled in the 4th century BC that chronicled human traits and foibles, from boar to boaster, cynic to coward, influenced the development of later fiction and drama, and remains sharply pertinent in psychology, journalism, cartoon art, and popular culture. Theophrastan character sketches deliberately describe a recognizable model of behavior rather than a mocked or skewered individual. Dickinson's ever hopeful Mr. Micawber, clinging to the thought that something will turn up, is a descendant of the Theophrastan character, as are Moliere's miser and hypochondriac. Psychologists and psychoanalysts have created other have created character types on what could be called the Theophrastan model, like the obsessive compulsive, the hysteric, the impulsive man, and the paranoid, whom Theophrastus, lacking the resources of the DSM, might have called the suspicious man. The white working class voter is a Theophrastan type, as is the equally hypothetical soccer mom, not to mention general types like the baby boomer and the millennial. By the 21st century, the character sketch, or character portrait, had become the frequent province of editorial journalism, both print and electronic, as well as of social media and stand-up comedy. Any kid with a passionate interest in science was a wonk, a square, a dweeb, a doofus, or a geek, wrote the scientist Stephen J. Gould, a self-confessed geek. Within a year or two, however, this depreciative term an overly diligent, unsociable student, according to Oxford English Dictionary, would morph into the glamorous style called geek chic. Why has this ancient mode survived so long? The characters suggested an adaptable form and set of basic techniques according to which human types of any century or country could be depicted, observes J. W. Smead. The book seemed to offer an invitation to later writers to borrow the method and use it to describe their own contemporaries, he adds. I cannot think of a smaller book with a greater influence. A consideration of that influence beyond the character collections of the 17th and 18th century, which were enormously popular in their own time, but much less so today, will speak directly to the fascination with character that still dominates intellectual and public life. Theophrastus, around 370 to 285 BC, born Tertimus, was a student and colleague of Aristotle, chosen by him as his successor to direct the Peripatetic school in Athens. His name, which translates to the divine speaker, is an honorific said to have been given him by Aristotle in acknowledgment of his eloquence. Called by some the father of botany, a topic on which he wrote two large and important early treaties, Theophrastus produced a wide range of scholarly work, very little of which has survived in areas as diverse as physics, biology, law, ethics, rhetoric, mathematics, music, and poetics. He is best known today for the 30 fictional sketches that are known collectively as the characters, each of which illustrates a dominant attribute or fault or vice. As Jeffrey Rustin points out in his edition and translation of The Characters, if it were not firmly established, Theophrastus's title might be better rendered traits, since it is part of his conception that individual good or bad traits of character may be isolated and studied separately 
a point also made by Aristotle in the Nachimelon Ethics. Aristotle himself had produced in that work a striking description of magnificence or the magnificent man, situated at the mean between stinginess and vulgarity. But the virtuous mean is not the substance with which Theophrastus will work in the characters. His thirty memorable characters are all extremes, whether deficient or excessive. Whether his goal in writing them was ethical, rhetorical, satirical, comic, or to enliven his classroom lectures, scholars have suggested all of these, sometimes in combination. The result was remarkable. His imitators and stylistic heirs included some of the most notable writers of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, as well as a surprising number and variety of modern practitioners. Psychologist Gordon Allport quoted the whole of the Perineus Man in his Pattern and Growth in Personality, observing, Though written over 2,000 years ago, it is applicable to some of our acquaintances today. Theophrastus's most immediate literary influence, however, was on the comic playwright Meander, who may have been one of his students. You will find the British scholar G. S. Gordon told an Oxford audience that whenever characters are written, there is this same conjunction of character writing and comedy. To every Theophrastus, his Meander. To Hall, Overbury, and Errol, the accepted imitators of Theophrastus in England, corresponds Ben Jonson with his comedy of humors, an earlier, harsher, and profounder version of the later comedy of manners. To La Bière, his professor disciple in France, corresponds the comedy of Molière, the French meander. To the tattler and the spectator, the New Testament, as I may call them, of character writing in England, corresponds to the comedy of Congreve, our English Molière. Gordon added that such a conjunction always implies or reflects some philosophy of conduct. Virtue once admitted to be the mean, as Aristotle had established, it became necessary to define all the extremes, the little, the too little and too much of the social appearances of man. This too little and too much would furnish the basic materials of comic types, from the miser to the libertine, the fashionable peacock, and the glutton. Comedy, as it is often observed, is an essentially conservative genre, as is satire. Both point toward the foibles and follies, and sometimes the delusions and sheer wickedness, of human beings. Here, ethical character, and two different but related modes of literary character, the Theophrastin prose sketch and the theatrical role come together. Since they would exercise so great an influence upon his imitators and writing and witting or unwitting literary heirs, it may be useful here to list the 30 characters as we have them from Theophrastus. Richard Aldington's titles for them derive from scholarly work of the early 20th century and generally adopted by commentators describe the person, the flatterer, the arrogant man, etc., Whereas Benjamin Boyce and Geoffrey Rustin, in his recent Loeb translation, names the characteristic, or foible, flattery, arrogance. In Aldington's version, the original Theophrastin characters are the dissimulator, the flatterer, the chatterer or bore, the rustic, the complacent man, the reckless cynic, the loquacious man, the newsmongerer, the unscrupulous man, the penurious man, the gross man, the unseasonable man, the officious man, the stupid man, the surly man, the superstitious man, the grumbler, the distrustful man, the offensive man, the unpleasant man, the vain man, the mean man, the boaster, the arrogant man, the coward, the oligarch, the late learner, the slanderer, the friend of the rabble, the avaricious man. From this list, even without looking at the individual descriptions, it is easy to understand Allport's sense that these 2,000-year-old types are readily recognizable in the modern world. 
Theophrastus's character remained fixed, notes the philosopher Amelie Rorty. They are not transformed by the unfolding of events. On the contrary, their dispositional characteristics allow them to be used to develop a narrative or to stabilize the structure of a society. In other words, as events unfold, the character becomes even more like himself or herself, sometimes to the point of comedy or parody. At a time when bad behavior flourishes, even among our leaders, says the novelist and critic Francine Pro's Theophrastus's, Portraits of boars, braggarts, and blowhards have never felt more current. The classicist Mary Beard agrees. These characters are people we know. They're our quirky neighbors, our creepy bosses, our blind dates from hell. The format of the characters is fairly uniform. Each begins with a definition of a quality. Chattering is the mania of talking hugely without thinking. Grumbling is complaining too much of one's lot. Perenniousness is economy carried by all measure. Although not all scholars agree that Theophrastus himself wrote these opening sentences, then the chosen trait is illustrated by a series of description of actions or words. The chatterer, in some translations the boar, sits down beside someone he never saw before and begins by praising his wife then describes a dream he had the night before, then passes to his dinner and relates it in detail. When the grumbler is told of the birth of a son, he retorts, you should add that my property is now halved and you would be telling the truth. Of the penurious man, or the penny pincher, we are told, at a dinner where expenses are shared, he counts the number of cups each person drinks, and when his servant breaks a pot or a plate, he deducts the value from his food. If his wife drops a copper, he moves furniture, beds, chests, and hunts in the curtains. The inner man emerges from this description of externals, observes Smeed. There is no abstract analysis. The form is perfect in and of itself. Here is one of Theophrastus's characters quoted in full to give you a sense of how the shape of the whole small form coheres. The gross man, or the obnoxious man, or obnoxiousness, is one of the briefer characters, but every sentence is telling. Grossness is not hard to define. It is obtrusive and objectable jesting. The gross man is the sort of person who, meeting freeborn women, pulls up his clothes and exposes his genitals. At the theater, he goes on clapping when others cease, and hisses the actors whom the public like. In the midst of a general silence, he leans back and belches to make everybody turn around. When the marketplace is crowded, he goes up to the stalls where they sell nuts or myrtle berries and pilfers from the pile as he talks to the stallkeeper. Somebody he does not know comes by in a hurry. He tells him to stop. Another comes out of court where he has lost an important case. He accosts him and offers congratulations. He goes personally to do his marketing and hire flute players. He shows his provisions to everybody and invites them to the feast. He stops in front of the barbers or perfumers and tells the customer he is going to get drunk. The sort of person who structure allows for a list of distinguishing actions and behaviors that describe not a specific individual, what later practitioners and scholars would call a portrait, but rather a recognizable type. The obnoxious man does things like the ones here mentioned. The reader can be relied upon to think of some additional examples to fit the pattern, the generality of the form, and the present tense, he goes on clapping, he stops in front of the barbers or perfumers, underscores both the typicality of the behavior and the way it might translate into another place or time. Think frat party or hashtag me too. This article has been The Flatterer and the Chatterer by Marjorie Garber, found in the Paris Review.